third chapter of the book of Yeshayi, Zechariah is in the midst of one his of his um his visions. And he says, Vayar Aini et Yoshua Koina Gadol Omed Lefne Malach Adonai Vasatan Omed Al Yimino No. I was shown Yoshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of God. And the Satan, it's not a Satan, the way we are uh, in the popular culture today, it just means sort of a, a prosecutor, accuser. Somebody's trying to tell God, we'll see the Satan is a prevalent character in the book of Eov. He's standing on his right, ready to, to tell God all the things that Yehoshua has uh, has done wrong, what he what he did. Now, what it is, it's not told to us exactly what he did wrong. Understanding based upon the book of Ezra, uh, other places, is this was related to um, the many Jews, including Kohanim at the time, who were married to non-Jewish women, to Ammonites and Canaanites and Amorites. And that's discussed at greater length in the books of Ezra and Nehemia and their attempts to deal with that and bring the Jews back towards uh, their tradition and, and family life. Continuing verse two, Vayamar Adonai la Satan yigar Adonai b'cha Satan, v'yigar Adonai b'cha bocher b'Yerushalayim alo zeud mutzal me'esh. But the angel of God says to the Satan, to the prosecutor, God rebukes you. God, right? God uh, sticks his finger in your eye. Uh, God is is uh, God is a, is a plucked from fire. He has chosen Jerusalem. God's destruction of Jerusalem has ended. That's what Haggai, that's what Zechariah is saying. Things are different now. Now, Yoshua, he was wearing dirty clothing, filthy, when he was standing in front of the uh, angel. What does this mean that he was wearing dirty clothing? So, right, clothing demonstrates who you are, what you what, what your role is. Think back to the earlier books, the way we describe sort of the clothing of Elio Navi, for example, how he looks like uh, not part of regular civilization, or how we uh, think of um, how we, we the, the coat, the meal, and uh, the cloak in the book of Shmuel, when Shmuel wore it and his mother would fix it, or Shaul, and the ripping it away from Shaul. So the dirty clothing here shows that there's something dirty about his clothing, his kuhuna. And again, most of the commentaries understand it is related to all of this intermarriage. Vayan, vayomer alom dim lefanav, lemor. Asira bagdaim habigadim atzoim me'alav, vayomer elav re'ei havarti me'alecha abunecha. And so the, the angel speaks up and says, take off the filthy garment, take it off of him and said to him, I've removed your filthy garment and thereby I've removed the guilt from you and you will be clothed in robes near the robes are, of course, the big day kahuna, the priestly robes, right? Where, where, where God is returning to Jerusalem, B'nai Israel is getting rid of their sins via Omar Yasimu Tzanif Tahor al Rosho. Then he gave the order, let a pure a crown be placed on his head. So they placed the pure crown on his head and they clothed him in the priestly garments as the angel of God stood by. So here we see the restoration in a sense of the kuhuna. They're coming back. They're coming back from being dirty, from being soiled, from making mistakes. And they can start again with clean clothing and they are tahor. They are pure which is necessary to serve in the Beit HaMikdash. And the angel of God charged Yoshua, he challenges as follows, If you follow my path, if you write, listen to my rules, you guard my house, my courts, I will permit you to move among these attends. That is to say, you will be like a malach. You will be like a like an angel, not just like a regular person. We see here something that's interesting in this verse. We see the beginnings of the power of the kohanim increasing. They're those who have, um, uh, it was more 19th century, I believe, Christian uh, academic scholars who looked at this and said that Zechariah changes things and is giving too much power to the priests, and he's from a priestly family. But we see that there is a little bit, right? It's not just the house. He's also guarding the courts. So there, it's more power. In the past, we've seen too much power concentrating in one area is not so good. Continuing verse uh, 8. So listen up, Yoshua, and the fellow priests in front of you. 
I'm giving you a sign that I'm going to bring my servant Tzemach, my servant from the branch. What does this refer to? So way back in the book of Yirmiyahu, back in the 23rd chapter of the book of Yirmiyahu, we're told that the days will come. Right? You have to trust me. V'hakimoti l'david tzemach sadik. Umalach melach v'iskil v'osem mishpat v'tzdaka ba'aretz. Right, God declares that there's going to be a branch that's going to be from David's line that's going to be risen up. And of course, this relates as well to the prophecy of the previous and his contemporary Haggai, who said to Haggai, tell Zerubbabel, if you listen to my ways and if everything works out, I'm going to mahapechet kol alam, the world is going to turn and the civilizations are going to turn and you and your people are going to be on top and you are going to sit on the throne. You're going to be my sign on this earth. We know it doesn't happen, but we see the hope here from Zachary as well. Continuing verse 19. This mark, which I placed right by Yehoshua, I was sure what it means. A single stone with seven eyes. Sounds like the menorah or something. That's right. Seven, I should say, the menorah, not the Arachanu Kiyote, the Beit HaMikdash, that's seven, uh, seven uh, lights. I will execute its engraving, says God. I will remove the country's guilt in a single day. On that day, God says, each person will sit under their vines, sitting under their fig trees, going back to a uh, prophecy of sort of of, uh, of idea of, of messianism. Right. Again, we've spoken about this in the past. Messianism in the Tanakh is not miracles and wonders. It's very simply, I shouldn't call it messianism, but, but the hope when God comes and B'nai Israel are sitting back, they are living in peace. They're not surrounded by enemies. So they can sit there under their fig tree, under their uh, vines, you know, eating fruit and drinking juice and sitting around with their friends. That is to say, no worries. That's the hope. The hope is not to be, it's, it's not the expectation. Everybody of the Jewish community is going to be, I don't know, billionaires and whatever it might be. And we're going to have, I don't know, unicorns uh, with wings flying us around. That's not, that's not the vision here. And according to most, it's not the vision. Even Yeshayahu talks about the lion sleeping with the lamb. There have been many rationalists throughout the uh, history, interpreters of the Tanakh, who said that that refers to the Jews and their enemies. The Jews, the lamb, the enemies are the lions. And so here we see a very quick reversal. And the great hope, what we see from to me from Zechariah and Haggai, which is important to point out, is in these two prophets, as the Beit HaMikdash is being rebuilt and the people are doing, surprisingly, they listen pretty quickly and they're getting on with it. And it takes, you know, they, they do it that there's great hope that this is just the first piece of a completely new phase, a messianic phase, if you want to put it as such, a phase where the Jewish community will reach, where the Judeans and, and Israel will reach this point of having really a, uh, a utopian era. Of course, we know far from it. It do, didn't happen. Second temple period was not a simple one. And while the second temple stood for about 585 years, these prophecies, as we said before, do not come to life at that time, at least.